All right, looks like we're good. It's recording. OK, uh, thanks, Marcus. Uh, so um, we're going to talk about uh, network quantization uh, today. And in speaking with different people, um, we have a, quite a wide variety of backgrounds in here. And, and it seems like uh, you know, for some people, just the idea of quantization is new. Um, and so let alone network quantization and hardware stuff. So what I, I thought the way I kind of structured this, um, it's not gonna be terribly long. Um, the, uh, I have a couple of really basic uh, things on just the background on quantization and why it's important. Um, a little bit of background on well, how do you even think about quantizing a floating point number? Um, and then a couple of kind of specifics on neural net specific things, sort of how do, how do we think about quantizing a neural network? What are some of the approaches? Uh, and that'll be a very high level overview. And then I'll go into one example paper, um, which is a, a state of the art, art paper that just literally came out uh, very recently. And it's, it's a nice paper because it incorporates a lot of different techniques into it. Uh, so the idea here is not to give a comprehensive review of lots of different papers, but I'll just use that paper as, a, as an example. So that's, um, so that's basically the presentation. Shouldn't last uh, too long. Okay, so what is quantization? Uh, for those who don't know, the, de the kind of dictionary definition is uh, it's the division of some quantity into a discrete number of small parts. Um, so you can think about this uh, example here of a sine wave. This is taken from Wikipedia. Uh, you could, you know, it's got lots of real value numbers and you could imagine quantizing it into eight different values uh, as shown here. So the red line is the uh, full precision floating point representation, not, not floating point, but full precision real representation. And then the blue um, staircase things are if you quantize it into eight different values. And at each point, since there's eight different values, you can index in using three, three bits into these eight different values. So now you can quantize every point in the sine wave using a three bit quantity. Okay, so that's an example of quantization. Um, as should be somewhat uh, obvious, the accuracy increases exponentially with the number of bits that you have. And typically with neural network training, we use 32-bit floating points. So it has something like uh, 4 billion possible values. Um, and many hardware implementations actually focus on 8 bits for inference. So you only have 256 values, uh, you know, such as an int 8 representation. And so as you, as, as you can see, as you kind of chop off bits, you it, the problem gets exponentially harder uh, if you to to really represent the full uh, uh, precision of, of values. Um, okay, and quantization is a huge, very long history, at least till 1948, if not earlier, in EE. So the main focus of this is just quantization for for neural networks. Um, yeah. Okay, so why is quantization important? Um, so floating point operations are expensive and slow on many chips, um, and int date and binary operations tend to be much faster. Um, another thing has the reason has to do with kind of just the overall size of, of the system and memory usage. So quantizing from FP32 to int date improves the size and speed, you know, by a factor of four and sometimes more depending on how you how you quantize. And so with quantized ways, you can get to much smaller and faster networks. So this table is from this um, uh, nice review paper by Guo. It shows kind of the number of parameters in kind of model, modern neural networks. Um, and these things are increasing really, really rapidly. Um, and ResNet 152 has 60.2 million weights or number of parameters. Um, and the number of floating point operations that you might use for doing a single inference pass here would be you know about 11 billion um, in there and you can see you know if you look at ImageNet on the right as you've added more and more parameters the error rate has decreased uh, over time and ResNet 50 which is one of the ones we're focused on has about 25 million parameters so it's somewhere in between kind of this Google Net and, and ResNet 152. Yeah. Okay some other things is energy usage is also lower for in date than floating point. So it sort of goes with the smaller and faster and fewer resources. Uh, quantized networks uh, could also be a little bit more robust to noise. 
Um, because you've kind of bucketed the values, uh, so small perturbations are less likely to have some change in, in the output. So that's another reason sometimes people have quantized. And some, even for adversa adversarial robustness, some people have used quantization as a technique uh, to defeat kind of adversarial methods as well. Um, so deep networks really rely on high precision uh, for their training and, and often for their inference. And so the question is, you know, how do you best quantize the numbers, you know, all these millions of numbers in a deep network to eight bits or sometimes lower and have kind of the minimal impact on the error rate. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a step back and see, okay, how do you quantize a single number? Um, so there are two basic methods. One is the most obvious thing is the is uniform quantization. So you can take the number line and you chop it up into a discrete set of buckets. And, uh, and for each bucket, you associate uh, the real valued number in it. So here, delta is kind of the size of the bucket. Um, and uh, in our scalar encoder, we used to do uh, you know, this kind of quantization. So uh, and here, you can go back to the real number from any buckets. If you look at the you know, some bucket, uh, it's associated with some, you know, you multiply it by some scale factor. So you have integer associated with the bucket. You multiply by some scaling factor and add a bias. And the bias here would be like half the bucket width. And that would give you kind of the number associated with it. And of course, anything within a single bucket, you can't tell the difference uh, between numbers within a bucket. Okay. This is a, and rounding is one example of, of a way to do this, but there's many different uh, ways to do this. Uh, the more kind of powerful method is non-uniform quantization. And the, the problem with uniform quantization is that the, the, the numbers that you care about may not be uniform in the number line. There may be many more numbers, let's say near zero and many fewer outside of zero, as an example. And so non-uniform quantization uh, lets you have buckets that are of different sizes. And then with each bucket, you associate kind of the canonical uh, number associated with it. Um, and so this is like a clustering uh, kind of technique. And so to do this, you usually have a code book that will map some index AI into the actual real value associated with it, uh, YI. And clustering is, you know, uh, one approach so that, you know, each region has roughly the same number of values. So if you had a lot of values near zero, you would have more buckets near zero and, and fewer outside. So that's kind of one, one approach to this. Um, a pretty kind of powerful version of this is to not think about one number in isolation, but to look at a vector of numbers. So weight matrices are not single numbers, they're, you know, they're multidimensional. If you look at a, uh, a vector of weights, you can do vector quantization. So you can do clustering in a high dimensional space. Um, so this is a, a more powerful type of non-uniform quantization. So by clustering in a much higher dimensional space, um, you can often exploit regularities uh, that you wouldn't get just in a single uh, dimensional clustering. And so now you have a code book. Uh, you still have an integer number of code book entries, and, but each integer now points to a vector of values in some high dimensional space. And this is the much more common kind of technique used in uh, deep learning. And then these approaches, kind of the overall size um, of the code book can determine the number of bits you need. So if you if your code book has 256 entries, then you need eight bits for each to, to encode each uh, quantized number. And you can kind of choose the size of the code book depending on how many bits you have available. Okay. So how do you quantize a neural network? And so there are a bunch of things you could imagine quantizing. So there's the input data that's coming in. Um, so that needs to be, quant might have to be quantized. There are all the weights and parameters in a network. Those have to be quantized. There's the activation values, the actual, you know, dynamic values that are floating through the network. Those have to be quantized. And if you're going to do training, then the back propagation error gradients also have to be quantized. And in the literature, it's, it looks like weight quantization is by far the most common and, and most papers actually ignore the other stuff. Uh, and there's, so I think they're just concerned with compression, like how do you compress a network into the smallest uh, network and they don't care about some of these other things. Um, 
And uh, like I said, if you're interested in training, then the gradients have to be quantized as well. Um, one kind of minor detail is, you know, we use batch norm a lot. Um, and for inference, batch norm is usually folded back into the weights. It's just a linear operation after the activation. And so you can just uh, fold it back into the uh, weights and you don't have to worry about quantizing the batch norm so, for inference anyway. Okay. Um, so there are many, many ways to quantize a neural network. Um, the most basic way is you could just uniform take each number and just do this uniform quantization and you can decide on the delta and the size of the buckets just by using histograms and just looking at the min and max of possible things that's kind of a simple way of doing it uh, some people have done things where you also scale it so that the weights become powers of two and this is nice because now multiplications if, if you deal with um, powers of two you can confirm, you can kind of transform multiplications to additions and then work in kind of a log space. Um, uh, many hardware architectures now support mixed precision quantization. So different layers will have completely different precisions. Um, and this can be exploited in, in some of these techniques. Uh, pruning is a, is uh, the, a lot of techniques do pruning first. Uh, if you can set some weights to zero, that's the easiest way of doing quantization. Um, and that will reduce the size of the network. So this is something we've, we've done a, a quite a bit of as well. Uh, clustering weights using vector quantization. Um, a lot of uh, techniques do training and fine tuning uh, along with quantization. It's not like a one step thing. It's you kind of treat it as part of the core loop. Uh, there are a couple of papers that have done Stuff similar to what uh, Marcus has, has discussed before of adding or simulating noise during training, variational techniques um, in there. Although I don't think this is a very well explored space. There's some really sophisticated ones. I saw one that uses reinforcement learning based technique. So it actually proposes some quantization, runs it on an actual hardware platform, looks to see what the result is and tries to build a predictive model of how how a particular quantization technique will actually work on a given hardware architecture because different hardware architectures have very different limitations and and characteristics so this is this was a, a pretty powerful technique i saw so as you can see there's tons of different things uh, you can do um, this table gives kind of a nice breakdown this is from this goal paper of the different things you know, he kind of splits it up into deterministic versus stochastic quantization and in the deterministic category, rounding is the most basic way. It's kind of one of the ways of doing uniform quantization, there's vector quantization. And kind of an interesting one is quantization as optimization, where you can treat quantization as part of the overall, um, you know, back propagation or optimization uh, algorithm as well. And then there's a bunch of stochastic uh, techniques here. So. Okay, I thought this this slide I thought was kind of a this picture was a nice picture. This is from um, work on something called deep compression. This kind of puts into a single picture a lot of the different techniques uh, that have been tried, and most papers seem to follow you know some aspect of this. So the idea would be here you either start with an untrained network or a full fully trained network, and then you go through some sort of pruning step. And this could be an iterative step where you involve training as part of it, and then you prune the connections down to some much smaller set. And then you do kind of the hardcore quantization step, which is this middle here. And the basic ideas here are, you know, very common that you cluster the weights um, using some clustering algorithm. You generate this code book, and now you go through this iterative process, uh, like an EM process, to constantly uh, re, you know, once you've generated a code book, you requantize the weights with the code book, then you update the code book itself, and then you do this as a loop. And so you're sort of updating the code book and the weights uh, simultaneously. And what they, what they don't show here is that often there's retraining of the entire network also end to end done as part of this. Yeah. Um, so the middle piece is kind of the core quantization piece. And then 
there's some sort of, if you're interested in compression, then there's some sort of encoding process at the end in here. And the idea here is to retain as much of the original accuracy as possible uh, throughout this. Uh, don't worry about these reduction factors that they have here. This is for a, a different network scheme. Okay, so most papers follow some aspects of this. Um, so the paper I'll talk about focuses on the middle one. Um, you know, some of the papers we've discussed internally before, like this uh, one by Michelle Covell, um, they kind of follow this basic scheme uh, in the middle as well. Any questions about any of this? Or go into one specific technique? Is this uh, pretty clear? I think it's clear. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I count, but I think it's clear. Yeah. Well, some questions I had before, uh, I, I didn't know, not, not from you necessarily, but uh, just, I didn't know if, uh, how much of this would be clear or not. Uh, okay. So this is uh, thing. Well, I, th well, I think I, I think one of the big takeaways that you've said so far is that um, people are doing this for various reasons, but if they're, it may be just compression, of the network or something like that. Is yeah, that... a lot A lot of it's just on compression, which is uh, a little surprising to me because that's only one of the uh, tasks. You know, they, they all, almost all make the point that, you know, running on hardware architectures is also super important, of course. Um, but they very few do anything more than quantize the weights, uh, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that was interesting. A special case of this seems like when um, you have all binary weights and all binary features. So is that somewhere you're headed with this? Yeah, so the technique I'll, I'll talk about uh, doesn't have that, but yeah, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of the techniques actually go to binary or even ternary, um, you know, maybe minus one, zero and one uh, kind of values. So that's kind of the kind of the extreme end of it. And in our HCM stuff, uh, HCM work in the past, we've always used binary synapses and you know, binary uh, activations as well. But we're not, the brain is very binary uh, in, in many ways. But we're not looking to do that here now in, in, the, in the current research working on. No, not yet. Um, yeah. I think eventually we, we hope to get there. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things I've uh, noticed is that anywhere there's <clears throat> potential for a nonlinear operation, like in softmax, that's also a candidate uh, for fixed point quantization and that also can be optimized. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, Michelle Covell talked about that in her paper and they spent quite a bit of effort uh, figuring out what the right quantization for the activation function is too. Um, Some of that, if, you're dealing uh, with, if you're dealing with ReLU, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, but if you're dealing with 10H or some other activation function, then it's important. I just want to mention quickly a, a very quick anecdote. Uh, three bits is not terrible. It used to be that the uh, CDC uh, 172 supercomputer at Oregon State University had a console with a three bit DAC. And so the test program to, to boot the machine included a three bit recording of Merle Haggard. And it sounded like Merle Haggard. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you, should, you should get that mic and play it for us sometime. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. You could do a Three lot bits per those. sample. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, you know, so much of deep learning also is, you know, it's just the deep learning system is a black box and you just use PyTorch as TensorFlow and run on these big GPUs. And uh, this, this whole aspect is, you, you know, quite ignored and forgotten. Uh, it, but it, it's a you know getting things running in practice it's it's pretty important oh okay what um yeah uh this this is a uh, uh some figures from michelle's covell's uh, paper and baluja's paper um this actually shows uh the histogram of weight values in 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 uh, i think this case it's amnis but this applies to a lot of different uh, neural networks um so the x-axis is different buckets of weight values and the y-axis is the frequency. And you can see it's pretty non-uniform and the distribution changes as a function of training. And I think they said it's, it, in these pictures it looks Gaussian, but it's closer to a Laplacian uh, distribution. Uh, so this is a, a typical uh, things. Unfortunately, non-uniform quantization methods as best as I can tell are not well supported in hardware. And, and some of you may know better than, than I do. Um, 
you know, you need to store this code book, which can be completely different for different layers at different parts. Uh, um, and uh, you know, hardware architectures don't always have uh, good support for that. That's uh, true. So one way it's been done before is with analog, and uh, you'll see this in radar signal processing where they work in log space. And so the, mm -hmm. the Laplacian distribution on the far right there is suitable for that kind of thing easily. Yeah, yeah. But we don't do analog as much anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to focus on one example paper, um, and that'll be done. And this uh, came out uh, pretty recently, and I thought it was a nice paper. There's some nice ideas in there. It's also, if you read the paper, there's a lot of different uh, techniques they use in the middle as well to to get their results. Um, and so I think this was, this is kind of a nice paper that encompasses a, a lot of different uh, techniques. And they also have the code available, um, PyTorch code available down there. Um, so the core, so this came out of Facebook. Um, so the core idea is the following. They're going to do non-uniform clustering of weights. Um, but the clustering method is going to emphasize classification error, not closeness to the original weights. So what I, the clustering technique I mentioned earlier with vector quantization, um, it just looks to um, have a kind of a uniform distribution of weight values assigned to the clusters. And it's trying to minimize the reconstruction error of the weights. So if you were to go through the clustering and then figure out what the the quantized weight values are and compare it against the original weight values, you're trying to minimize the difference. Here they say, well, that's not really what we care about. We care about the end accuracy of the network or the performance of the network. And so this figure is kind of a nice figure that um, uh, walks through this idea. So what this shows is um, there's kind of in-domain inputs and out-of-domain inputs. So let's say you're trying to classify dogs versus cats. So in kind of this big gray region here are all the possible dogs and cats. Um, outside of that, you know, of course, there's a very high dimensional space and it's not going to look like this, but this is uh, conceptual. But outside of the dotted uh, region will be all other possible images and most of which will be completely random noise. Um, uh, but all we really care about is the subspace of cats versus dogs. So let's look at kind of the original network. So this is this uh, psi here in the gray, with the gray boundary. So the gray boundary here uh, classifies uh, cats versus dogs. So it's this kind of complex nonlinear thing. So on one side of it, I think below it are all the dogs and above it are all the cats. But outside it, but it, it has values outside of this dotted region too. In fact, most of the thing is outside this dotted region. So it, you know, got a very complex shape outside of this region. And the standard techniques will just try to match, um, uh, you know, the, the, ac the, the accuracy of the weights themselves. And so most of what it's trying to do is match what's happening outside of this region, because most of the region is outside of the region. Uh, most of the volume is outside of this region. And they don't ignore what's happening inside of the region. So it might end up that if you just try to match the shape of this curve, you'll match it very closely outside, but it might be that inside the region, you don't match it well. And because of that, you'll misclassify, let's say this husky dog or this cat as a dog. Um, even though if you look, step back and look at the entire space, it's modeling the decision region pretty well. But the in-domain re in region is actually a very small part of it. So instead, what they're trying to do is what this green boundary shows, they don't care what's happening outside of the region. They're just trying to model the decision boundary within the in-domain region. Okay, so that's only within the subset that you care about. So they're only go they're going to specifically look at the reconstruction error for in-domain inputs. Um, and they're going to use, uh, uh, that's kind of the essence of their idea. And then they're going to use fine-tuning fine the weights in the code book after quantization. And it turns out they also use knowledge distillation that uh, Lucas has been looking into. Um, uh, as, and this ends up being pretty critical uh, in the fine tuning step. Okay, so this is the basic idea of their technique. 
quick question. Um, yeah. If I could. Uh, wouldn't there be an argument made that you should have done this for the original network? Yes, yeah, so the original network is trained with in-domain inputs. Right, but I mean to suppress the out-of-domain. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, some, some techniques uh, do do that. Uh, to some extent, regularization, um, you know, tries to get at that. Um, you know, there's some, you know, typically with supervised learning, you have, you know, but, you know two or more classes and you just focus on it um, and you don't even ever look at it outside and uh, you know, contrastive was, learning techniques will try to look at stuff that's outside of a domain and incorporate that into the error function. But yeah, um, I was just yeah. thinking in terms of, uh, of inhibiting digital spoofing, uh, this would seem like this would be something you want to do all the time. Yeah. 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 So there is a, there is a technique called a negative sampling and it's used a lot in natural language processing, but that's kind of the idea use out of the main images or, or language to train our network not to recognize that. So, yeah, so I, image, I, I, I've seen it using image as well. I, I was just thinking that if uh, you did that originally, then, uh, then you, as an alternative technique, rather than using, um, applying this technique uh, to the uh, network that had issues outside, you could more closely track a more correct network than the be, uh, to begin with. Yeah, you can. You, it would help this problem, but it's really hard to do uh, properly cover the out of domain stuff because these. You know, remember, these are million dimensional spaces, and so it the it, the volume of the space is huge. Uh, it it's really hard to, you know, exhaustively characterize the out, you know, the, the stuff that's out of domain. Okay. So here's kind of their, their clustering method. They have a couple of tricks that they do. Um, if you look at the convolutional filters here, um, you have your input features and each input feature has a K by K kernel. So let's say three by three. And then you have, um, you, have you know, C out of these uh, filters. And what they do is they split each weight vector into smaller sub vectors to make it kind of easier to cluster. So uh, typical vector quantization might take this entire volume as a single vector and, and cluster that. Um, but they split it into smaller K by K sizes, uh, K by K size uh, sub vectors. Um, so basically they reshape it um, into, this, into this matrix and they, they look at this uh, you know, K by K chunks as, as the vectors that they're quantizing. So their code book at the end will have D of these, um, uh, you know, codes, uh, you know, vectors in there, and um, each vector will be of size k times k, upper k, uppercase k times k. I don't know why they choose lower k here for the number of code book entries. It's confusing. Um, okay, so that's so they the first step is that they take these. Oh, I should say they they're going to do this layer by layer. So for a given layer, they take the weight volume and they, they create these little sub vectors. And then they do this uh, uh, clustering technique. So the first step um, is they assign each of these uh, weight values to, the, to a cluster. Um, and the clusters might be randomly initialized uh, at the beginning um, or initial, you know, initialized using some random subset of these uh, these uh, these weights, and then what they do is they pick some subset of the training set X, and they try. Th what they do is they look at the difference between the true weight vec sub vector and the uh, the cluster, um, the cluster index. Uh, you know, each of these. I'm sorry, each of these code book entries. They project that difference using the the entries of the training set. And they try to minimize that that error. So they try to pick codebook entries that minimize the uh, projection of the true uh, training set. And I should mention that this X here is the output of the previous layer. Uh, is the activation of the previous layer into this layer? Okay. So they take the the training set. They see how it's coming into this layer. 
uh, they look at the activations, then they try to minimize the projection of that input activation uh, by the, the codebook entry. So this so is how they're going to try to incorporate the in-domain uh, entries. And, and yeah, they do at, that for every layer? That, uh, so yeah, they just sum yeah. Up so they're going to, yeah, they start with the lowest layer and they move to successive layers. So, uh, you know, imagine this is some layer in the middle of the network. You've already quantized the stuff below you. Now you're looking at the activations coming in from some subset of the trading set. And now you're trying to minimize the, uh, you're, you're trying to reproduce the, 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 those input samples as faithfully as possible in this projection. Okay, so that's how they assign uh, a codebook entry to each weight value through this projection. And then they do this other step is, okay, now the codebook entries themselves were initialized, let's say randomly. Now they do uh, a least squares thing to just update the codebook entries uh, to minimize the difference with this projection. Okay. So they do this uh, two-step process here. Um, so they first figure out the best assignment to the codebook entries for each weight value. Uh, and then they update the codebook entries themselves based on that assignment. And both of these are done based on the, on the training set. Okay. Um, after this is done, then they fine tune that layer. Um, and they do this uh, in the following way. So each layer is basically retrained after quantization. So here they, they keep the assignment of the weight vectors to the clusters fixed and they're, they're fine tune actually the, the code book entries again. And what they do is uh, they, they run the network through the training set uh, all the way to the top. They, they compute the error and they back propagate it and they compute the average gradient coming into each cluster. Um, um, and update the clusters using uh, SGD. So this, they, I think they do this for an epoch or two um, after the previous quantization step. And they found that if they did this using knowledge distillation, using the uncompressed network as the teacher, that gave them significantly better results than if they just used the training set uh, to do this fine tuning. So they do this for each layer, then they go on to the next layer and the next layer and the next layer, and then the whole network is quantized. And then they do this global fine tuning where they fine tune the entire network, um, again, using knowledge distillation. Um, and the only difference now is that the batch norm layers are, are in training mode. Okay, um, is, this, is this pretty clear? Um, so they showed uh, a bunch of results. Um, the way they show the results is based on compression factor, like how much compression they get. Um, and they have different block sizes uh, for the, the size of the codebook entries. Um, and they show, um, yeah, they do a bunch of different, uh, they show a bunch of different stuff. Uh, and basically their technique seems to be at least at this kind of compression range uh, seems to do better than any other published technique by a pretty pretty large margin. Um, and so what's an example? Um, you can see here, um, you know, with K here is the number of codebook entries. So if, if you look at K equals 1024, you would need 10 bits to uh, represent each codebook entry uh, plus 1024 codebook entries itself. So using that, they can compute kind of the overall size of the network. And that gives them a compression factor. And then that compression factor, there are several percentage points above some of the best existing uh, work on that. Um, I think when they get to kind of smaller compression factors, uh, they seem to be, you know, close to the state of the art. Maybe, maybe they're a little bit worse. It's hard to tell from this graph, but uh, at higher compression factors, they seem to be quite a bit, uh, they hold up the accuracy quite a bit better. This particular one is without knowledge distillation. Here's another one where they have with uh, knowledge distillation. Um, and here they're showing that um, 
you know, for ResNet 50, they can maintain accuracies up to about 76 or 77%, 77.8% error with a, a pretty decent compression. Uh, so Ty, it's sorry if you can hear my dog. <laughs> I was wondering yeah, whose dog it was. <laughs> so Ty, you have a, it says semi-supervised. Do you know what, why is it semi-supervised? Uh, this is the network that they used as their knowledge distillation network. Oh, that's a, probably the same one we are using, right? Uh, could be, yeah. Um, it's it's one of the Facebook ones, I think. Okay. Yeah. So the reference methods HAQ and DC. What do the acronyms stand for? HAQ is uh, hardware aware quantization. Uh, this is the really complex one I mentioned earlier that does ah. reinforcement learning as a part of its its loop. Um, so okay. that's the other sort of method that seems to be doing really well. Uh, and and the DC is on, on the graph. Uh, hold on. Um, that one I don't know. I don't know what that one is. I can look it up later. It's, uh, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't do as well as the HAQ. Well, if you look at, further on up, it's... Oh, it's, it's here, it's, it's pretty comparable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it. I think um, this is basically, as far as I can tell, kind of the state of the art in, in weight compression and weight quantization right now. Um, here are two other papers that do a nice review of uh, quantization methods. Uh, the GUO one is, is kind of more sweeping. And this is, um, I haven't really looked at the Krishnamurthy one in detail yet, but it has a lot of very, you know, very specific techniques. It's a little more kind of uh, concrete. So this might be a nice one to, to look at as well. Um, okay, that's, that's it. Any, any questions? Uh, are any of these techniques specific to convolutional neural networks? Or I, I can see there's a whole review paper on it, but is that, are those techniques very specific to convolution or no, there's just more general? No, I, I don't think so. Like this one is, uh, you know, this one is not specific to convolutional networks. Um, you know, you still just have to decide what the size of the block sub vectors are, but you can use it for linear layers as well or other, other layers. Um, yeah, um, uh, there are a couple of techniques. Actually, I'm sorry. The hardware aware quantization, if I remember, they take into part of what they do is they're trying to. Um, so in convolutional networks, you have a lot of shared weights. And so they are trying to enforce the sharing of weights. Um, well, uh, take it back. That's actually within a convolution layer. So that's not, that's not specific to convolution layers either. Yeah, so the answer, short answer is no. Most of these techniques are pretty general. <laughs>